I was, I was so getting into that. That was Jonathan Wilson, a very uh, dodgy version. Anyway, it happens. It's Friday. It's gorgeous. It's a long weekend. Who cares if it skips? Um, and the, the track was called There Is A Light from his, his new album. And before that, we had The Birds. Turn, turn, turn. And uh, <clears throat> my guests are here, Jacob Dillon and Andrew Slater. I always call you Andy. What's well, the that, Andrew thing? Well, Make you look seem it, intelligent? No, no, that, that takes a lot more than that. No, you, you know, it's like... Uh, Andy you know Slater, me. Andy, Andy Slater. Well, that's because we've known each other a long time, but when I was a journalist and I'd write my byline down, that's what I wrote. When I look at my driver's license, you know, if, if you were my mother, you call me Andrew. I don't know. It looks In print, it looks funny. Anyway, call me whatever you want to call me. Well, I've always called you Andy. It just, uh, if for a second there, I didn't know who it was. That's good. Because I've never seen Andrew before. Well, you know, then you can leave some of your stuff behind. And then I saw it, who it was, and I'm like, oh, it's that guy's coming on. It's that guy. But I'm with this guy. It's, I'm with this guy. We're Mr. Jacob Dillon. How are you? How you doing? Good. I like you. You look good in that, in, in the, uh, the, the, the documentary. Would you call it a documentary? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Okay. The movie is, uh, <clears throat> I just walked in here, so I'm a bit up and all over the place. You tell me, what's it called? It's called Echo in the Canyon. Yeah. And it's basically about hippies in, in like the no. 60s, 70s. It's not well, about yeah. hippies. Oh, come on. Okay. But here's it's the thing. It's about punk rock. No, okay. Okay. Exactly. It's, but here's the thing. It's, you know, there's three periods in Laurel Canyon, really. There's the beginning when they all come out, or all the bands come out here, and they, they're, they're emulating the Beatles, you know, and the birds have a hit. And that first record, you know, makes people think, wow, come to L.A., because that's where we're going to have success. And the second period is a psychedelic period, which you want to talk about, the book you brought in. And then the third period really is after the psychedelic period and all the craziness, I think it, you know, it goes back to a retrenchment to uh, you know, Roots Rock and the search for the individual. And that's when you get Joni Mitchell here and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. So the first period is not about hippies. It's about that age of innocence when the idea of being in a band, they see A Hard Day's Night and how cool it is to be in a band like the Beatles. And that's the period that we're celebrating. Yeah. I, lo I loved it. I watched it this morning, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, it brings back a lot of memories for me, because I kind of, I, I strolled out here around, uh, I started living up uh, Wonderland Avenue for like five years with Michael DeBars and his wife, Pamela DeBars. So I was here, and I was, I was, I used, to, before I got sober, around 81, 82, I was kind of out here, and, uh, I used to go up to uh, um, the guy up Lookout Mountain at the top. He had a house up the top there, the blues guy. The blues guy. Mm. Famous English blues guy. John Mayo. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And, and his missus up there, I, I used to hang out with him. And uh, so I get it. I, I get the whole, you know, Los Angeles, Laurel Canyon vibe completely. You know, I, lo I loved it when I first came in. Coming from London, Shepherd's Bush, where people <laughs> were still throwing urine out of their windows, like what? Dickens. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do, because I'm from New York, and, you know, I played in a little concrete park, and, you know, the idea of hearing this stuff on the radio in the 60s on WABC or at WMCA and Cousin Brucey and, you know, these guys was, wow, listen to this sound, and the sound, you know, painted a picture in my head of this idyllic place at the edge of the country in the Pacific and I saw these movies like it's a mad 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 world the yeah. beach blanket bingo yeah and I was like look at this 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 is where I you got to go I thought but it took you, a while to make it you have a movie in there that I tried to buy last night and I couldn't get it model shop it looks so yeah. good it's and, you know Jacob and I were sitting in my house and it's really the genesis for the project we were trying to figure out what we were going to do next. You know, you get to a point in your life where sometimes you sort of look backwards of where you've been to figure out where you're going to go next. Yeah. And this, we were watching TCM, and this uh, film comes on, and I, which I'd never seen before either, and there was L.A. in 67. It's a French director named Jacques Demi, and he, he, sh he just, the way he filmed 
the farmer's market and Beautiful. And, the, and the Sunset Plaza and, and all, all this yeah. stuff. It just reminded us of that period, you know, in the Age of Innocence, before things got so crazy and before... Before douchebags. <laughs> Well, before you couldn't go anywhere where there was too many Uber drivers or Lyft drivers or, you know, people texting and driving. But anyway. Or oh, them little birds flying around. Exactly. Exactly. And the cars look cool. Anyway, it just reminded us of that beginning period of L.A. and music, even though that music's not represented in the film. And so, and the guy in the film, you know, as a guy, he's, he's... Who is he, that guy? Well, he's Gary Lockwood. He was in 2001 at Space Odyssey. Good looking but, dude. Well he's, dri- well, he's driving around. He sees this French girl in the like farmer's little, market. Uh, English MGs driving yeah, around, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, exactly. The green one. Yeah. But he meets, he sees this French girl, and he's, you know, he's just, he sees her, and she, he decides to follow her around, you know, and she, he winds up following her into this place called Model Shop, where you sort of dress up in bikinis and weird businessmen can take pictures of you. Anyway, I just... Dodgy. Dodgy, but... I don't know, you know. Just you saw, in touch. I saw this guy driving around with nothing, and I and I said to Jacob, "This is what we're doing. We're driving." I mean, you know, Jacob's probably driving his kids around, but, um, you know, I thought, "Oh, this is, this this looks interesting." Anyway, it just started our our journey to find the songs and, you know, to maybe make a record because we started to make a record. We didn't start to make a film. So when did you start? When did you start doing this, Jacob? Was it 2015? Yeah, I guess originally the idea was that it was going to be a celebration of the 50th anniversary. And then it became the 51st celebration, <laughs> and then well, 52nd. Uh, and those numbers just, you know, they don't appear as well in print. So yeah. we, you know, that was the original idea was the 50th anniversary. Well, you still got, you've even got footage of Tom Petty in it. Yeah, we do. Um, Tom was one of the last interviews. Um, uh, it was one of the last interviews we did for the film, and unfortunately I think it was his last filmed interview uh, as well. Um, well so it's... Um, uh-huh. What was that guitar shop? Where was that guitar shop? That's right shop? here in Santa Monica, True Tone. That's True Tone? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was trying to figure that out. Well, we, we had to close it down and re- reposition some guitars around okay. for Tom, you know. Um, but yeah, you've been there. You know the shop. Oh, yeah. Many times. And uh, I know I did recognize the uh, uh, Sunset Sound when you were yeah. filming in there. Yeah, well, we did a we, good portion of it. We drive around to some of those original studios that were here that those bands all recorded in. In the mid '60s, and you did some recording in England too, in some studios, yeah. right? We did. We 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 went to Eric Clapton, in uh, at British Grove, yeah, which is where he likes to work. And if you're going to record Eric Clapton, you go where he likes to work. Yeah, he was good. He was he was insightful. I thought in in the documentary, I, I like what he had to say. Yeah, he was great that day. I mean, he gave so much. It, everyone in the film, you know, the thing you get to see is a, you know, it's not like a journalist. And an artist, you know, talking in the film. It's it, you know, Jacob is talking to to these people, and it's like two songwriters talking. So yeah. you feel, in a way, sometimes you feel like you're eavesdropping on a com- personal conversation that people are having. And and I think, uh, you know, that's the charm of the film. And people like Eric were very forthright with the things that they were saying, and I, probably because, again, they're talking to Jacob, and they felt like we weren't going to, you know twist their words and try to make something out of it that wasn't it was going to be real yeah yeah, it was going to be real and we wanted we we were really focusing on you know the humanity and in all of it you know the sense of community and people trading ideas and i'm sure in england you know at that one at that at that moment and somebody should maybe you know make that documentary go take it take it andy baby uh, (laughs) steve i think i think this is for you i I think it's been done though all that stuff a thousand times i'm so tired of talking about punk rock well but I went to see you play at the Great Southeast Musical in 1978 in Atlanta, which is where I was. That's the first time I saw you, my friend. That, that was the was, first show when we uh, came to America. Believe me, I know I was there. Do you remember it? I do. What was it like? <laughs> it was like, it was, was like. Was it seeing, different? Was it weird? Like, oh, what's well, this? Well, first of all, you were in Georgia, you know, and at that time, you yeah, know, you know, you had the Atlanta rhythm section, and you know Molly Hatchet, and that was the stuff that was happening there. And you guys come in. You know, and there was a little community in Atlanta of, you know, of hip people. Yeah, trying what's that place get... called in Atlanta? Well, there's it's a little got five a Greek points. name, a Greek name. A Greek name? Like the guys. It must be a restaurant, buddy. No, no, no. It's an area. It's like where the other bands from. Buckhead? R.E.M. Oh, and... well, that's Athens. Athens, yeah. Okay, like a Greek. Right. See? <laughs> the Greeks, you're right. right. You're okay. <laughs> Steve, I should never question you. Yeah. Well, that, but that happened a little later. When you guys got there, 
it you it know was just it, flares it, well, what and tashes. Yeah, and and you know it was making Georgia, and it was the the end of that era. And you guys just came in there, and it was like, you know, you lit the sky on fire. And but it was like a lot of there was a lot of hype. Prior very to much. It, well, right? all the, all the critics came to Atlanta, like as I remember, yeah, to see that show. Uh, but you know, it was like you, you know, you completely altered the course of of music. I mean, which we know. You don't need me to tell you this, but that moment, that night, it was like, okay, this is over, and now this is here. This represents rebellion. And it took a spirit. while in the states though to catch on. I think. Well, the, the I, flares I, as and, I the re- flares and the it, tashes took it, a while to change. As I remember, when Rolling Stone put you guys on the cover and it said "Rock is dead," I think was the was the yeah was the title and you know that was the moment that was a defining moment and maybe 20 years later it was a defining moment for nirvana and and right. when things changed you know yeah, changed that for sure for sure uh, um what do you think of the rock and roll hall of fame are you a fan or uh of the institution itself the whole thing yeah when are you uh, uh I, mean, I, you know I have what? an idea you're not really. <laughs> Why? Because I ruled it out. <laughs> no. no. I mean, we're in there. Well, we I didn't show yeah, up there. You didn't go. Right. Because there's a few things I don't agree with. Yeah. Charging 10 grand for for your wife while you're okay, yeah. but your wife and your kids have to pay 10 grand to sit there. And yeah. what you get honorated, I think, is, yeah. is absolute Well, that was, that was uh, I think when you guys were inducted, it was, was it already at the, in, at the Barclays Center? It was in the arena at that point, right? It was in New York somewhere. Yeah. Well, then, then it started selling tickets. Yeah, I mean, we—I've been before um, when it was—it was at the Waldorf when it was. Uh, you know, maybe it would have felt better then. It was much more of a. Didn't you induct someone? Yeah, Tom Petty. That's right. Yeah, and that was a lot of fun. But, um, you know, I've been reading about that and hearing about it. It really was just like that. It was a small room of round tables, and you kind of recognize most people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know how it would feel now. Now it's, um, you know, it's, it's massive. They sell tickets and it's yeah. for fans, and you know. Yeah. We went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland mm-hmm. recently. I gotta pick me a thing up. It's, what do you it's got there? there? The thing, the statue. Oh, I haven't got it. They're all there. Our statues. Well, on display at the at the museum. In a cupboard somewhere. somewhere. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if they like us yeah. or not. You know, because we I think it's great for them. The I think it's great for them. We're it's not the only ones. Them. Yeah. But we didn't do it. Interesting. Uh, the kid from uh, uh, Radiohead didn't want right. to do it. The singer. Um, you know, a few people. Neil Young wasn't interested. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think about? I know I'm going off track a little bit, but I'm just curious because t- we're talking about genres of music, like in in the, in the movie. What do you think of Janet Jackson being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? It's not to me. It's not rock and roll. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know how they decide. I mean, I guess they they decide what influence and. What they've had on other people. Should I don't have know. an I mean, R&B no, Hall of Fame. It's a lot of things. I wouldn't call it rock and roll, but um, it's not what I call rock and roll. No. You know when you're on iTunes and you look at genres, mm-hmm. this, that, the other. Yeah. You know, I don't see Janet Jackson in rock and roll. No, but, well, and, and, and guitars are kind of a big part of rock and roll. He's, absolutely. You know, um, I don't know. It's certainly changed. I know that when I was there, I think the year that uh, Tom Petty was inducted, I think it was the Talking Heads and the Ramones. Yeah. Um, and I'm spacing on who, who else might have been there, but it really felt like that might be. Like it, we're kind of at some point it's going to start thinning out, but there was still Prince, there was still you guys to go. Yeah. So there's always somebody, but you're going to get like how many do they put in there a year? It's getting tough. They're going to run out. They start yeah. going to put like Lava Boy in soon. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> we we'll get their red suits. You get those. Was that those? Yeah, red suits. Was it a red suit? Yeah, red pants red that were kind of too the tight the for the singing. Pants. It was a little heavy. Headbands and red pants. Yeah. <laughs> the singing was a little heavy. He liked his hamburgers too. Um, from Canada. <laughs> you got to watch the thighs. I love Lover pants. Boy. <laughs> what could fold our week, Kane? Um, a big part of the thing in it, which it, you kind of, it kind of starts off with Tom Petty in there in the guitar shop and the, and the twelve string Rickenbacker. Right. That definitely had that whole. That was the part of that whole sound. Yeah. Well, Andy could tell you very eloquently that it really is the defining moment. That twelve string. It's you know we did 
showcase it quite a bit because it's it's kind of the, the launching point. You know, a great songwriter, Warren Zevon, yeah. great 70s songwriter, he said to me, if Roger McGuinn had played the opening notes to the f- you know, first ba- Birds record and dropped dead, he still would have exercised the most pronounced influence on rock. And really, it's that, it is that moment that, that changes everything because the electrification of folk music you know, first, probably yeah. wouldn't have happened in New York because New York, the, the folk scene was so rigid in the 60s. They just wanted to hear, you know, their stories and long songs. And, and, and California, you know, and you know this, it represents a sense of freedom. You could, anything's possible yeah. here. And I think Roger, you know, trying to figure out how to do something different, uh, he sees the Beatles and he sees George Harrison playing that Rickenbacker in Hard Day's Night, and he takes it and he electrifies folk music, and that really sets off this thing because he 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 does Bells of Rimney, and then George Harrison hears Bells of Rimney, and he does If I Needed Someone, which winds up on Rubber Soul, and Brian Wilson hears Rubber Soul, and he says, okay, yeah. he does Pet Sounds, and then the Beatles yeah. hear Pet Sounds, and they do Sgt. Pepper, and in a lot of ways, that's the basis for almost everything. That sort of came after it, in t- in, yeah, and all the tributaries. Story of how he ends up with the twelfth string, George, uh, Roger. Is it George Harrison? Or oh well, it, yeah. In well, the George. film, they, uh, you know, Tom tells us he's. So what happened is John Hall, California uh, guitar maker, the Rickenbacker Company, takes the second uh, twelfth string ever made, and he wants to give it to the Beatles because John Lennon, and he wants to give it to John Lennon because John's the guy who plays the Rickenbacker on the Ed Sullivan yeah. Show. He goes to New York. And Ringo has the, uh, sorry, George has the flu, and the other three guys go out for a photo session, and George nabs the 12 string. And as Tom Sellers in the film, that changed rock and roll. I think that's probably worth a few quid, right? That guitar. <laughs> well, Danny has it, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah, he has it. Who? Well, George's son, he's a friend of Jacob's and mine. Where's Danny he doing? <laughs> you don't need it, man. Where's your Les Paul? Where's the Les Paul? I got, well, I know where that is, but I ain't got it. You don't have it? No, but I do know where it is. Who's got it? I'm not telling you. You uh, might th- steal it from that, under. Well, that's under. worth a few quid, right? And not like these classic rock guys like the Pages, the Becks, and the Claptons, and the Hendrix. They all go for silly money. Punk yeah. guys, it's not yeah. that much. Yeah, but those power chords, bud. Yeah, I yeah. know. Well, I still got them. <laughs> you, can't, you can't take them away. <laughs> uh, should we play some music? We've been chatting for a bit. We're here with Jacob Dylan. And my man, Andy Slater. And uh, they're here promoting the new movie, documentary. Oh, where's me bloody papers? What's it called? Echo in the Canyon. Echo in the Canyon. And we're going to play a Mama's a Papa song. But this is your version? I think so. This is the new version? As it starts, yeah. Yeah, Shovel? Yeah, we're Jade. Okay, fantastic. Take it away. You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox, KLOS. My guest, Jacob Dillon and Andy Slater. Did you direct it or produced it? You just produced it. I directed it. What are you talking about? Oh, excuse me. (laughs) Excuse me, Andrew. (laughs) Okay, Stephen. The name of the movie is Echo in the Canyon. And we're here talking about it. uh, It's it's starting in theaters today at the Arclight in Hollywood and the Landmark Theatre on West Pico. The soundtrack is now available on BMG. I bought it last night on iTunes. I think it was like 9.99, 13 songs. And they're well produced. Did you do the music too? You produced that? I did, I you did. did. You yes, didn't, yes sir. You didn't twiddle the knobs, you was just uh, saying. I'm not a knob twiddler. Yeah, me neither. I'm a, uh, I don't know. Did Jacob, did you have anything to do with the production of it? Uh, well, I mean, I know you, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, of course. But you get credited for producing? That's a good time to bring that up. Yeah. (laughs) I guess not. I got an executive producer. uh, For the movie. For the movie, yeah. Let me just say, you can't make a record. Every, Every record you make, it's a collaboration. The guy says he's a producer. But, you know, really, I mean, the artist has to be there and has to have some sense about, you know, what you want to do that represents them well. And so yeah. you just, you know, in certain instances, you just try to stay out of the way when you're a producer. You just say, okay, bands, but this is great. You know, you get a sound on the drums and you get that stuff going. But, 
you know, every time you make a record with somebody, it, it's always collaboration. I mean, that probably that's the way it is, you know, in every art form, whether it's this great radio show. It takes a lot of people. It takes Listen a village, to as they guy. say. <laughs> <laughs> Such a charmer, Mr. Slayer. Um, what else was I? You, you, you do you do a lot of interviews with uh, like like uh, Stephen Stills. Who was there last night? Crosby. Was he there last night? Well, we had a, we had a, we had a premiere last night. Yeah, you know, old school Hollywood. The movie played last night at the Cinerama Dome, which is where Sunset. Sunset, you know, which is where they did Star Wars. And yeah, yeah. Apocalypse Now. So for Duh. the two the two of us to be there was was quite an honor. And uh, and the people that came and played, Stephen Stills came down and played after and after the, they showed the film, and then we did some music. And so Stephen Stills was there, and Roger McGuinn was there, and Cat Power was there, and Jade Castrinos from Edward Sharp, or formerly of Edward Sharp, was there, and and some other people from the film who were interviewed. Ringo was there. It was it was a really great night. It was just you know. No, Nora Jones didn't seem to participate a lot in it. She's in there a good portion. Only that one. That one. Uh, she didn't. She didn't show up for the live show. Um, you know, she's in at, New York at the old yeah. No, she's uh, she's in New York, so it wasn't quite as convenient. Yeah, she's got a nice voice. Yeah, she's got a great voice. I mean, really, the, you know, in terms of the record, you know, you have, you take those songs. You can't. We don't want to do a tracing paper version of those songs. And some of those songs, you don't. You know, from that period, you don't. They don't need to be covered. I mean, nobody wants to hear another version of Good Vibrations. That's masterpiece so what we were trying to do was take these songs from that period and turn them into something new and the one way to do that was to turn them into duets and in the case of you know like Nora Jones and Cat Power and Fiona Apple and Jade we did them as a conversation between men and women so like on the Cat Power song you know you showed me which was written by you know the birds is uh, McGuinn and Clark it was done it was a hit for the turtles but that's like you know Two guys singing, so in this version, Flo and Eddie. It, exactly. In this version, it's Jacob and Cat Power, and when you kind of do that dialogue, you showed me, no, you showed me, it becomes very sexy. Yeah. And and you know, with Regina Spector and Jacob doing uh, expecting a fly, same thing. It's like it's about the end of a relationship, and then it becomes this dialogue. So you know, Nora Jones, we we got the best selection of women singers that we thought we you know we could find that some were relevant to living here, and some were just our friends, like Nora. Yeah. Beck's in it. Beck is in it for sure. Yeah. Um, Whose house was that that you was all sitting around the coffee table? Well, was Beck and it was Beck and and no, Cat whose Power. house was it? Oh, whose house was it? I mean, it's, I, I mean I, they don't have to give me the I address. Know, I know whose house it is. If, is it a secret? Not really. I mean, what what are you gonna do? Well, it was my house. I'm coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? I'll, I'll take you after I see you on the trail. Just get one of them rings, you know, the rings. What ring? You press a doorbell and it's a, you see who's at your door. Yeah. It's I a glass house. All I have to do is look to my left. I have. <laughs> I, the, it's funny. The door has one of those, you know, like little peephole things in it. I'm like, what? The, why do you need this thing there? It's, you just, it's all glass. I just stick my head sideways. I see you, Jonesy. It's a nice place you got. Well. Yeah, you're not know. happy with it. You want it's something not bigger. That, you know, you? it's it's a funny thing, and I'm sure you can relate to this. You know, I could live in one room. Yeah, if I had me too. a guitar. I do basically. You know, now I have a, you know an iPad and a, watch what I want to watch, and uh, I don't know. So, yeah, it's it's great, but but uh, there's something there's something about the aging. You know, I don't know. Uh, uh, Troubadour or the aging seeker that this you know I I can I can demi I can eliminate everything and get everything into one room. So if I have to, you know, when when the zombies come and the apocalypse happens, what do you do with all those vintage cars? <laughs> yeah, I don't, well I could live one. I don't okay. know. Yeah, exactly. But I'm okay, the same, man. I wake up, right? I'm in bed. I get out of bed. I go in the kitchen. I make a coffee. Have something to eat. Go back in the bedroom. Lie down. I like to lie down. I don't like to even sit when I'm at home on a couch. I only have black underwear on. I don't know why I have to tell you it's black underwear. But no, me too. And that's it. I never sit in the living room. I never sit in there unless every blue moon some people have come over to watch football or something. 
But I still don't, I don't put clothes on for that. I just still have me black underwear. Yeah, well, but, I don't want to scare the kids, I, I, you know, or, or people come over. But that's it. I, don't, I really don't use any other any other stuff, you know. That's kind of the da- daily, weekly, monthly, yearly thing. I think it's, you know, an outgrowth of uh, your punk rock, you know, ethic and, and life on the road. You know, you're, you're in a room that's, you know, you can live in one room if you keep moving. I don't need to go in any other rooms. Like I said, I like to lie down in bed. You know what I mean? I don't even like sitting. I definitely don't like standing up. Standing is a real drag. <laughs> unless you're walking. <laughs> Maybe that comes with age. You know, gravity, that's the thing. Gravity takes over, and then, you know, you got to lay down. <laughs> Keep it all level when you're lying down. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, you know, you get to a certain age where you're, you only look good lying down, you know, because nothing's <laughs> moving. <laughs> oh, oh, it's true. It's true. Um, okay, did we talk about the 12-string? Yes. Um, do, you, do you have a 12-string? I don't have one. Are they a lot of money if you like bought like a vintage I one? I think a good right one, and they're they're really difficult. I mean, you're like dedicated to those. You know, one string's out of tune. It's about a twenty minute job right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work, but you know, the one that the one. I mean, that's the one. I mean, a lot of people make them. A lot of people make the big full body acoustic ones that sound lush, but that's the one that creates that sound. Townsend used to use one in the early days. A Rickenbacker. Mm-hmm. You'll see a lot of pictures of him in the sixties with one. Yeah, for sure. Paul Weller played one. Not yep. it's a big difference between a twelve string and a six right. string yeah. electric though. You know, Peter Buck, who was in REM, he was a guitar player in REM, he played one. Mm-hmm. And, and and I remember, you know, I knew him in college and, and he, but she didn't play one in college, but le- in REM he did and his strings. He had like twelve or thirteen gauge strings on that on that Rick and Vacker. I mean it was really right. hard. it was like you couldn't bend anything on that. Yeah. So. Well, they're, they're, they're a one-trick pony, basically, right? That's, that's it. That's the sound. Yeah. I mean, well, the 12-string. Yeah. yeah. But I, you know, I remember those, you mentioned Paul Weller and uh, Pete Townsend. That's in the 70s, 80s. That's the only, the, not a lot of people were playing them. Tom Petty played one, famously. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I don't know. You know, it's taken, it's one of those guitars that needs to, probably needs a comeback. Yeah. Glenn Matlock, the, ba- the original mm-hmm. bassman in Sex Pistols, used yeah, to have a, the bass, a bass. Yeah. yeah, some people played the Getty Lee played the bass. It was a 4001, is that what it's called? Model? I'm not sure, but I remember messing about with uh, Matlock's bass, and I thought it was the weirdest thing. It, it, it's, it, I can't put my finger on it. It's just a weird instrument. It's a, it's a weird thing. Well, McCartney played one in the 70s. Did he? Rickenbacker, yeah. Is, I, is, it, is that a German? Is he German, Rickenbacker? <laughs> Maybe who? I mean, it sounds like it sounds it. German. It, yeah, yeah. And Easy Dead, the guy who started it, is he still going, Mister Rickenbacker? You know, I don't know. I have to. I, have to ch- I know John Hall is still around, and he was the maker. He he was a guy from the company, but I really don't know the 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 source <laughs> of, the, of the, the. I'm sure the someone. Ethnic. I'm sure someone's bought it. If it is like you know Fender or yeah. someone. I'm sure they come under some other umbrella. Who knows? But you, but the, like the reason I keep harping on about the Rick and Bag is because it was a very. Whenever you hear that song, you just think of California. I do. You know. That's the California. I mean, you know, we talk about the California sound. Uh, it, it is the Rick and Backer twelve string that orchestral thing and then it's the harmonies of the bands because i think as they all had multiple singers and multiple songwriters you know in a, you know for the birds for example you've got mcguinn and clark and crosby and and the sound of the birds really is mcguinn and clark when they sing unison yeah yeah the high voice and then crosby sings the harmony and he goes all these places when Gene Clark leaves the birds, the the sound changes. Those first two records, their their thing is the the. It's only two part harmony, but it's a great. It's just a it's just a great sound. But the California sound is that the Mamas mm-hmm. and Papas. John Phillips has such great vocal arrangements. You know? Yeah, and of course then you have Brian Wilson. 
Yeah. Know? And I mean, that guy. And just it's useless. You know, like Mozart. He so. can't write nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Nor produce. Well, the Beatles had George Martin. You know, they were, he was doing the orchestration. And Brian just has Brian. He's a kid, and he's in that room, and he's got the wrecking crew, and he's directing traffic, and he's got all these ideas. Yeah. You know, you listen to Just Wasn't Made for These Times, and the clave, and the sound, and the reverb. And all. I mean, it's just Brian. So he's, you know, he's... He said he was, uh, when, he, when, he, when he did Pets, about Pet Sounds, he was inspired by the Beatles. Uh, rubber Soul. Rubber Soul. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's part of our... It's part of our American history, Jonesy. It goes back and forth across the water all the time, doesn't it? You know, you guys taught us sometimes what was great about our culture, like in blues. And a bunch of bands didn't make it here that was American. They had to go to England to get to get sorted out. What See what we do for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then we throw the tea in the in, you know in the harbor. You can keep the tea. Just give me coffee. I couldn't care less about tea. Too acidic. Um, should we play some more music? We're going to, uh, uh, this, this one is featuring Neil Young. I just wasn't made for these times. It's a Beach Boys songs. Are you singing on it too, Jake? I am. Neil and I together. What, one, one thing before we go into it. What was going on at the end with Neil Young? Is that current? Yeah. That was, that was him playing yeah, guitar I mean, on it? Yeah, describe, uh, that is him playing on the, on, um, one of the other tracks, not this track. Um, okay. Is it, he's playing questions, right? He's playing uh, what's happening. Oh, he's playing what's happening. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, that's it. And but the thing is, you know, it's it, it's about the, tr the echo of time. So in the end, you see. I don't want to give it away, but it's sort of about time travel. You see him before, and then you see him current. Yeah, yeah. We're here with Jacob Dylan and uh, director Andrew Slater. You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox. Take it away. I keep looking. For you're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on Cal OS. That was a beautiful version of I Just Wasn't Made for These Times, a Beach Boys song featuring Neil Young. And it just happens we have Jacob Dylan in the studio and Andy Slater. Now, when's your next uh, thing, tonight? Well, the movie opens tonight at the Landmark Theater and at the Arclight Cinerama Dome, and we're going to do a Q&A as they tell me we're doing and then in at the arc light we're going to do something that's a little more comfortable for us that we normally do which is we're going to play a show which has never been done really you've never had a full rock band playing at a movie theater so you're showing so, the movie and then playing showing the movie and then doing a q a while the crew has to actually assemble everything oh man and we did it last night steven stills was there and roger mcguinn was there and, and you played Hamper. last night too yeah how'd it go then it was great. People love it. You know, you, you, again, it's 18 bucks. You go in the movie theaters, pay 18 bucks. You're going to see the movie. You're going to see Q&A. You're going to see a, a rock show. People are like, we're taking the prices back to 1965. Well, I could so, do without the Q&A. <laughs> well, what, what do you do when the crew's setting up? I mean, people got to... Well, come you, for yeah. the red vines, the pop <laughs> you, you could You could spin... <laughs> we got candy, you could too. Spin plates. But, but tonight, it's Cat Power and Jade and Jacob, and we do songs from the Mamas and Papas and the Buffalo Springfield and birds and you know whatever jacob decides uh, is good for the night i love the version of in my room beautiful well that's the great fiona apple um, and what and what i didn't like is i think you should should have had the whole bloody songs in the movie not just like interesting well you know look if you're trying to tell a story it's very hard to take four minutes a song you you've got to you know you you're, you, you obviously a fi you obviously filmed it all though right yeah why don't you have a special features with all the we could the, 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 you the could songs. do just the concert do we have to pay your royalty for that idea see that's why you <laughs> came on here that's why i get the starbucks there you go okay we're gonna visit the duke when we come back we'll have some more chit chats and play some more music see you in a minute you're listening to jonesy's jukebox on cal os that was uh, Bob Dylan standing in the doorway. Mr. Dylan was 78 today. The album was Time Out of Mind. Before that was Jacob Dylan in my room with Fiona Apple on vocals and Jacob. Beautiful. That's from the, that's from the soundtrack 
of the movie Echo in the Canyons, and there's a big uh, there's a big fandango tonight <laughs> at the um, Cinerama Dome. Cinerama Dome. So you're showing the movie, you're doing a Q and A, and then you're performing with a bunch of artists that are in the, in in the movie. Yeah, uh, we got the Cat Powers with us tonight, and Jade Castrino's with us, and we're gonna do a little Q and A. How long uh, are you playing for? How many songs? Uh, are you maybe it's what thirty minutes or so. Yeah, uh, forty minutes. And you I mean, it's been a long evening already. Yeah, we've got well, an hour and a half movie and a Q and A, and you know, you don't want to you don't want to bore people to death. Not, not. I'm trying not to. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's I appreciate your honesty, <laughs> but I'm trying. <laughs> we strive yeah, for not. You know what it's you. like when you're at a bleeding screen, and then there's the Q and A, and it goes on. Yeah, it's a long night. You got to take that into consideration. But if it's good music, then why don't you put the music first and then do the Q and A after when everyone, no, no one gives a, a who? Well, how are we getting the gear on the stage? That's the problem. I'm we telling have to, you, you got you got to get the plates out and you got to juggle some balls. <laughs> and, we get uh, you out there, John. See, if you start talking, I can people, dress up as a clown. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you should get moderate. You can ask the questions. Yeah. Oh, oh no. What? Oh, that would be great. You well, want I'm, to come down and be a moderator? One ju- night? I'm just moderated for an hour and a <laughs> half. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, what was another highlight for me in the movie? I'm trying to remember because I, I watched it at seven this morning, and I watched all the all the way through. And like I said, I really enjoyed it, and I'm going to watch it again. What about Michelle Phillips when she tells you what "Go Where You Want to Go" is about? Yeah, it's about uh, she was she was a bit of a nymphette. Is that out of order to say that? Well, I don't know if I would I would classify it as those words, but you know, she was said she was having a very good time. She, you know, she said that she was raised in a free atmosphere. Well, it was the hippie thing, wasn't it? I guess. I mean, you know, it's sixty five. It's pre hippie. But... Either you're a hippie or you're just horny. It's one of the. <laughs> I think m- most. Uh, I mean, I know I, when I come to California, I got horny. Hornier, <laughs> so maybe that had something to do with it. Well, but it's in the air. Maybe coming from the cold, dark, dreary, dreary, pour, mother, pouring urine on your head, <laughs> mother country. You came out here, like John Phillips says, you know, the girls rats. in the canyon. Well, rats. rats. We have rats. Yeah, but you don't really see them. Well, actually, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. What am I talking about? But they have suntans. Yeah, say, uh, but it was a different time. It was a different time. I love looking at old footage of of uh, Hollywood and L.A. Like the movie Shampoo is another. I love that period. Where well, he's mean, driving I, around on I, his I, triumph. I love it. I love it. That movie looks sort of Hal Ashby. It's it's one of the great periods. That you 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 think about that movie, and you think about there's scenes in Annie Hall, and then you, there's scenes in The Long Goodbye. But yes, Shampoo. Beatty's character in that movie is it, it made you think, oh, we have to come out here. You know, he's driving through the canyon on his bike. On his Triumph, no he, helmet. He's yeah, got his nice yeah, hair. Exactly. He's going to a party in the can. Just you know, there's all his all his clients in the in the in the salon. It looked oh. like it couldn't get any better. I know. We all had to come out here. And he was only too. <laughs> I wouldn't. Know. In the movie. <laughs> but um. Also, one of my favorite romantic things about California is the kid stays in the picture. That's another beautiful thing captured, mm. you know, California, uh, Robert Evans' documentary. Yeah, amazing. Um, what are we doing, man? Should we play? We're going to knock it on the head? Yeah, we've got to do. Have, have you had enough? Do you want to promote a little bit more while you've got the chance? Well, tonight, the movie opens at the Landmark Theater and at the Arclight Theater, and we will be doing, Jacob and I will be at the Landmark, then we will Uber across town, hopefully really? traffic will will allow us. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're men of the people. You're not going to get a bird? No, no there's no limo. Perrier? No, no, we're in the people's limousine, the oh, Uber. Okay. And, uh, and then we'll go to the Arclight, and uh, the film will screen, and we'll talk some while they set the gear up and then we'll play a show which is the first time they've ever done that and so what for time? 18 bucks you just come on down what time should one get there i'd get there at 8 30 when the movie starts if you want to see the movie yeah and uh 
I hope you'll be there, Jonesy. Oh, sure, baby. <laughs> oh, you're, 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 you've been in California too long. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I, I hope you had fun. I had fun talking with you. And uh, there was one other question, and I've, I'm blanking on it. Uh, but I best we go and get a uh, visit to Duke. And uh, you'll be gone, and then I'll remember the question. And uh, that's it. We'll see you in a minute. Love pets? Join us.